Let us enter into this time of worship and celebration. In the safety of this sacred place, we are invited into a time of gratitude, reflection, renewal, and hope. Come in, bringing all of who you are. Calm your hurried pace. Know that you are not alone. There is strength and caring support for you here. Let us quietly reflect on these words. Today, in fact, this entire long weekend, we celebrate Harvest Thanksgiving. At this time of year, we pause from our busy routines. We intentionally set aside three days of a long weekend to gather together with our families and friends and our loved ones to rejoice and give thanks for the fruits of nature, to rejoice at the gifts of autumn harvest. This morning's readings from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, tell us that this idea of celebrating the harvest is as old as the lawgiver Moses and the book of Exodus. Thanksgiving, celebrating this day, is an ancient tradition, and it is good and right that we should do the same. Yet Thanksgiving, when you think about it, isn't something we should pay attention to and do only once a year. Do it once a year and then put it all behind us until next year. In fact, the necessity and the importance of thankfulness is bigger, much, much bigger than that. Much bigger than simply gathering together, rejoicing, praising God, and giving thanks one day or one weekend during harvest time. As this morning's New Testament lesson the 17th, from the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel points out, our gratitude as people of faith, our gratitude as followers of Jesus, our gratitude even if we are secular people of goodwill should be a way of life. So I'm going to try to get at what I and explain what I'm trying to get at in my remarks this morning by something I, doing something I rarely do. And that's by telling you a personal story. Last Wednesday, Wilma and I did a tour of the Zeckelman Holocaust Center in Farmington Hills, Michigan. We are accompanied by our son Jason and his wife, who majored in museum studies and is employed there. As you might guess, through its artifacts, the archives, its state-of-the-art technology, and other things, this story tells a horrible, the horrific, the tragic story of Hitler's Nazis and the Holocaust in Europe between the years 1930 the years, the 1930s and the 1940s. We began our tour at the very beginning by inspecting a railway car, a box car, a box car that was used by Hitler and his Nazi henchmen to transport Jews and others to labor camps and death camps all over Europe. And compared to today's boxcars, it's surprisingly small. Nevertheless, 100 people, men, women, and children, were crammed into that car. It only had one tiny window. There was standing room only. No place to sit. No food. No water. No toilet facilities. All that for the days-long journey to slavery and death. With every corner that we rounded at the Zeckelman Center, Wilma and I saw indis indisputable evidence of brutality after brutality, cruelty after cruelty, all designed for the planned 
efficient industrial scale murder of millions upon millions of people. Yes, most of them were Jews, but there are also, and the Zeckelman Center makes this very clear, there were others. Jehovah's Witnesses, the mentally ill and physically challenged, socialists and communists, homosexuals and lesbian, Russian and Eastern European prisoners of war, ministers and priests, and anybody else Hitler's efficient Nazi killing machine deemed to be its enemy. Yes, the tour of the Zeckelman Center, that museum, was educational. And it was deeply moving, but not in a good or a positive way. After three hours, approximately, of touring the place last week, I went through a whole host of emotions. The first one, and it started with that boxcar, became anger. Anger at the human capacity, the willingness, and sometimes the eagerness to commit genocide against groups of people. Anger at twisted, perverted political and economic ideologies. And then my anger faded. It faded went to frustration, and then it was just an overwhelming sense of sadness. Sadness. Then, as I neared the end of the tour, the remnants of the anger plus all that sadness turned into something else. And the only words, it's really beyond description, the only words I have for it are deep and dark depression. And finally, after three hours were up, I could see a bright light ahead of me. I thought that was an exit door. You know, and I was really, really happy to see that. Happy to see it because I'd had enough. I just wanted to get out of that place. It was all lit. I headed for it. It was not an exit door at all. Instead, it was, we w came out of the darkness of Hitler and, and the Holocaust into the brightness of an Anne Frank display. And what I thought was an exit door wasn't an exit door at all. It was a gi giant window. And as you look through the window, you could see this horse chestnut tree. And I, I found my feelings starting to change, and I thought, what's this deal on this horse nut, chestnut tree? And there was a write-up on the side, beside the window, and I'll just share some of that with you. It said, after introducing us to Anne Frank and excerpts from her diary and pictures of her and her family, this is what this said. Though Anne Frank and others hiding with her could not go outside, they could see the branches of a chestnut tree in the courtyard outside the secret annex in Amsterdam. It goes on to say, on September 23rd, 1944, Anne wrote these words. From my favorite spot on the floor, I look up the blue sky and the bare chestnut tree on whose branches little raindrops shine, appearing like silver. When I looked outside, right into the depth of nature and God, I was happy, really happy. This right on, right up goes on to explain that a windstorm tore down the original tree that Anne was lo and her family could look on in Amsterdam when they were hiding from Hitler and the Nazis. But they managed to save seven saplings. And the tree that we were looking at through the window was one of those saplings that had matured and grown. It had become a living memorial to Anne Frank and to all the victims of the Holocaust. I looked at it quite a while. And I could feel something happening way down deep inside me. In spite of the ugliness, the suffering, and the horror, and the brutality, 
and the inhumanity that I had been exposed to in exhibit after exhibit after exhibit, I could sort of start to feel the anger and the frustration and the sadness and the depressions just sort of slowly draining out of my heart and my soul and my body. And I looked for a few short moments at that tree. I looked and I looked. And then I went to the next exhibit. And that next exhibit just lifted my spirits. The last one was how the world had said, never again, never again. It featured the Nuremberg trials, the United Nations and governments and people of goodwill all around the world taking step. So there should never again be a Holocaust. When I saw that, plus the Anne Frank display, I felt another powerful emotion. It wasn't happiness. It wasn't relief. Far from it. But all I can describe it as was a sense of appreciation, a sense of thankfulness, a sense of gratitude that at the end of the day, the spirit of Anne Frank and the human spirit of goodness and decency and dignity and justice could survive the worst the Nazis and their ilk could throw at it, but it could overcome and triumph over it. I spent a lot of time this past week looking back and reflecting on that experience. I owe the Zeckelman Holocaust Center a great big thank you because it gave me feelings of appreciation feelings of gratitude. You know, there's a lot to be said about being grateful. There's a lot to be said about having an attitude of gratitude and cultivating a lifestyle of gratitude. Several studies in the sciences and social sciences have shown that being grateful, being grateful makes us happier and healthier as individuals. Being grateful makes us stronger as a church community. And Diana Butler Bass's wonderful book with the title, Gratefully, sums all this stuff up beautifully. This author explains that living a life of gratitude in a medical sense, in a medical sense, gives us stronger and healthier hearts. Living with gratitude reduces the possibility, the risk of heart disease. And heart patients who have cultivated an attitude of gratitude sleep better, they feel less depressed, they suffer fewer inflammatory side effects. In short, from a medical perspective, a grateful heart is a healthy heart. And then Diana Butler Bass goes on to say this, in addition to heart health, gratitude has also been linked to emotional well-being, lower levels of anxiety and depression, decreased panic attacks and phobias, reduced rates of alcoholism and substance abuse, and longevity. Yes, people who have a grateful heart live longer, actually live longer than those who are ungrateful. And that's not the only, the whole story. Stories show, or studies also show, great, grateful people have greater self-esteem, stronger willpower, more meaningful relationships, deeper faith and spirituality, and believe it or not, improved academic and athletic performance. And overall, grateful people are happier than ungrateful people. Gratitude, gratitude. Well, what is gratitude? It's a feeling. It's a feeling of the heart and soul. It's a unique emotion. It's a feeling of appreciation for people and things. It's an appreciation of the many gifts we have been given. And this was summarized very well, I think, by A.A. A. Milne in Winnie the Pooh. She explained that gratitude arises from the human heart. It's a feeling. And she, uh, Milne wrote these words. 
Piglet noticed that even though he had a very small heart, it could hold a rather large amount of gratitude. And gratitude can be fed by almost every human emotion. My own experience was anger, frustration, depression, and that eventually gave rise to gratitude and thanksgiving. Sometimes it can be worry or anxiety. Sometimes it can be hope. Sometimes it can be wonder or surprise or delight or encouragement or joy or peace. Almost any emotion can feed gratitude. And gratitude is one of those in spite of things. In spite of. In other words, you can feel gratitude in spite of the worst that life can hand you. You can feel gratitude in spite of the challenges and the difficulties and the heartbreak you're experiencing in your life. Think about it. When did you feel gratitude this past week? When did you last feel gratitude? Maybe it's when you had a cup of tea with a friend. Maybe you saw a beautiful, maybe you saw a beautiful rainbow or a sunrise. Maybe you watched kids play in the park. Maybe you know someone or you yourself got a positive medical diagnosis. Or maybe it's when you gathered around the table. Maybe other times when someone gave you a bit of encouragement or you got an unexpected email or maybe a greeting card. So gratitude's a feeling, a unique emotion. But it's more than just a feeling. Gratitude is a practice. What you do with that feeling after you have it counts. What action you take after you feel gratitude rising up in your heart and your soul is really important. I think that this morning's reading from the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel shows that to the nth degree. Remember the story? Ten lepers. Jesus healed all ten of them and sent them on their way for certification by the priests that they had actually been healed. Now, I'm sure all 10 of those lepers felt grateful, appreciation for what Jesus had done. But none of them acted. None of them practiced gratitude. Only one, a Samaritan, came back and thanked Jesus. Only the Samaritan used his words. And you know what's really the punchline of that whole thing is in brackets. It says, by the way, he was a Samaritan. Here was a person who had everything against him. The Jews and the Galileans felt that Samaritans were half-breeds and heretics. And he had something else against him because he was a leper. He'd been cast out by the authorities to live or die on the streets or in a leper colony. The point I'm trying to make is that you and I can be like that man. We can use our words. We can use simple thank yous to express our gratitude. We can go out of our way once we have those feelings to send an email to say something that shows you appreciate someone for something they've done or simply for just being there. You can post your stories on, by email or on social media, or, but you must not be satisfied with just the feelings of appreciation and gratefulness, you have to act them out. It's not enough to say you feel gratitude. It's like the story in My Fair Lady. It's not enough to say you feel it. Remember that quote, just don't talk love, show me. All kinds of things we can do right here in this church. We can show our gratitude by expressing and demonstrating our appreciation and our care and compassion in so many different ways. We can visit a neighbor, a member of this congregation, and share the gift of life. We can contribute to a Thanksgiving or a Christmas dinner at the downtown mission. We have many can-share programs here. We can donate to those. We can reach out to the abused women and children at Hiatus House. The list could go on and on and on. There are many possibilities. 
we have that feeling in our hearts and souls of gratitude. We can express those in words, and then we go beyond words and live them out and act them out. So I want to conclude by remaining personal. I want to wish you and your loved ones a very, very happy Thanksgiving today. And I'm going to tell you about one of our, it's actually Wilma's dinner practice, Thanksgiving dinner practices. As our family members gather around the Thanksgiving dinner table, Wilma insists that each one of us tell all the rest, answer this question, what are you grateful for? Now, sometimes this is easy. Sometimes, for some people, it's like having a wisdom tooth pulled. But when we do it, when we finally get around and the last person has answered, what are you grateful feel for? There's a sense that, yes, gratitude's a feeling. Gratitude is what we can express. But most of important, gratitude is something we take at. It's expressed also in our good deeds. Gratitude's not easy. Gratitude is like having a garden. It takes planting and watering and weeding. It takes time and attention. It takes learning. It takes patience. It takes routine. But eventually, eventually, gratitude blooms and we can harvest it. This is Reverend Dell Stewart. I hope you enjoyed this audio presentation of today's time of worship and celebration. If you did, please click the like button. You can also click on subscribe to make it easier to find our channel and click the bell to receive a notification each time a podcast becomes available. Peace and joy now from Westminster United Church in Windsor, Ontario.